Hello, Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. The current series called Understanding the Jews, and this is lesson number 28. So last week, uh, we had begun working through the steps of the Seder meal uh, that every Jewish family holds uh, as a commemoration of the original Passover, a time when God took all the firstborn of Egypt, uh, but passed over the Jews when he saw the blood on their doorpost. And we had gotten through the first three steps of that meal, uh, the Kadesh, meaning sanctification, uh, Urshatz, meaning washing or cleansing, uh, Karpis, which is interpreted to mean a non-bitter spring vegetable, and now we are ready to discuss step number four, which is Yahatz. I have a little graphic here to show you on the screen. Uh, you'll see that in the Hebrew, uh, the word Yahatz means to divide, uh, and the leader of the feast at this point in the meal would actually call out Yahatz. Uh, he then will take out three pieces of matzah that have been placed in a white bag called a matzotash, and he shows them to all the people at the table who are present. He then says, this is the lakem onai, the bread of affliction, which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. And he says, all who are hungry, let them come and eat. All who are needy, uh, let them come and celebrate the Passover with us. Now, matzah is Hebrew for unleavened flatbread. Uh, more often resembles a cracker. If you took note of the little graphic that I showed you a minute ago, uh, it kind of looks like a cracker more than a piece of bread. Now, there are pretty obvious reasons for the Jews to eat matzah at Passover. Uh, first is the fact that they had left Egypt in such haste uh, that they couldn't wait for their bread to rise. Hence, it was flat. Uh, but the more important reason is in Exodus 2.15, and that is that God commanded them to eat unleavened bread. And they were to do that whenever they observed the Passover in the future. So, it was done by commandment. But in addition to the general rule, uh, we're going to try to get to the bottom of the reasons for there being three pieces of matzah. Why three? Well, these three pieces of matzah are stacked on top of each other, uh, and the leader of the feast will take out the middle piece of the matzah, and he breaks it into two pieces. Not two halves, but two pieces. This is where, well, the Jews share a common trait with us Christians. Uh, and I'm talking about certain childish traditions. Uh, for example, Easter egg hunts. Yeah. Uh, and likewise, the Jews have their, what I'll call silly traditions. Uh, so the leader takes the larger of the two pieces of that middle piece of matzah, because like I said, he doesn't break it exactly in half. And this larger half has a name, and it's called the afikomen. From the Hebrew, which means that which comes after. And he carefully wraps that piece in a linen cloth. He then tells the children, close your eyes, don't look while he hides that napkin somewhere in the room. So, well, now begins the silliness part. Uh, the children are encouraged to hunt for this afikomen as the dinner progresses through its courses. And, of course, things are orchestrated so that the afikomen is always found uh, near the end of the meal at the exact time when it is needed. And invariably, the child who finds it gets a prize. Uh, from what I was able to find out, 
this little exercise of the Afikoman, well, it's been around since the days of the Second Temple. Uh, and thus, it would have been practiced during the time of Christ. So a couple questions come to mind. Uh, and in answering those questions, uh, I don't think that we can help but once again see that our friends, the Jews, are unknowingly identifying the Messiah whom they have rejected, Jesus. First of all, why are there three pieces of matzah? Well, there's many speculations among the Jews for employing these three pieces of matzah during their celebration of the Passover. Some of them are based on Jewish law, but others come from Jewish folklore. Uh, but if they were to employ some honest contemplation or to honest reflection, almost all of the various explanations that you will see should have pointed them to Jesus. Some of the Jewish sages offer that the three pieces represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sounds plausible enough, but why then is the middle piece broken? Uh, why would Isaac, in essence, be broken? Well, of course, you've probably figured out already that there is no single answer. Uh, the Jews have several possible explanations. One such explanation says that the matzah really represents the bread of poverty uh, because only the poor can afford a broken piece. Another take goes on, on this goes on to the covenant that God made with Abram or Abraham. I'm going to have a habit. I, when I go through this, I'm going to say Abraham one time and Abram another time. I apologize, it should be Abram up until his name was changed officially to Abraham, but I know I'm going to slip back, but, so forgive me for that. But this was a covenant uh, whose promise actually does reach its literal commencement at the time of the first Passover. So I want to spend some time here. In fact, I'm going to spend quite a lot of time right here uh, because the circumstances surrounding this covenant uh, that I'm referring to right now is pretty mysterious. Uh, and the first time I read it, uh, this was years ago, it really left me to wonder what exactly is happening here? Uh, and what should I be taking away from all of this? So let's first read the passage. Well, actually it's, it's an entire chapter. Uh, and then we'll try to figure out as much as we can from it. Um, the context of it shows that this covenant was made right after the Battle of the Kings, when Abraham, if you recall, had rescued his nephew Lot, who had gotten himself into some trouble, and was then blessed by God's eternal high priest, Melchizedek, whom we understand to be the pre-incarnate Christ. So let's get to this scripture and read it through, and then we'll make some comments on it. Genesis chapter 15, beginning at verse number 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, 
to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me in heifer, and here's where we get into the mysterious part, so try to pay attention. Take me in heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. <clears throat> and he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, in horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So, right at the top, in the first verse, we see that Abraham is receiving this message from God in a vision. He's picturing a scene of which we are not really told. And in this vision, God is communicating with him. And it's clear that prior to this vision, Abraham's thoughts had been distressing and, and troubling to him. Uh, because the first thing that God says to Abraham in this vision is for him not to be afraid. Not to be afraid because God is with him. God recognized that Abram had just turned down all the spoils of victory when he had defeated those kings. All the rewards of victory. But be that as it may, God told him that he was still going to have a reward. A better reward. Because God himself was going to be his reward. And notably, we find that God would later repeat this very same exercise with Abram's son, Isaac. So I want to go there very briefly just to show you this. And for that, we're going to go to Genesis 26, just one verse, uh, verse 24. Scripture reads, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. So he's talking to Isaac. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. So, it's interesting that God made the same promise about inheriting the land to Isaac as he did to his father Abraham. And God came in the same way to Isaac. He really came to prop up Isaac's confidence in the promise. Uh, and after this vision by Isaac, God sent Isaac's neighbors in the land unto him to make a covenant of peace. And that peace 
gave Isaac a sense of security. Hence, no more fear. So, but back to Abram. So now we're going to go back to chapter 15 again. We're going to look at two verses. Scripture reads, And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So now we find out what it was that Abraham had been stewing about. He didn't know how God's earlier promise, this is back in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis 13, about his seed taking possession of the land. How could that come about? Abraham still had no child. So now, Abraham wants God to be a little more specific. He says to God, okay, if you are my reward, what is it that you will give me? And whatever it is that you will give me, what difference would it make? You know the situation I'm in. I'm getting on in years. Abraham was an old man. Abram was an old man. He's thinking you could literally give me anything. But when I go, everything I have is going to go to my steward, Eliezer. And Eliezer is not my son. Abraham was fearing the loss of his posterity. He feared at his death, his family line was going to end. Let's look at Genesis 14, um, 15, 4 through 6, which is the next passage. The scripture reads, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this is God's answer, This, Eliezer, shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness, that being his belief. So, at an earlier time, God had shown Abram the land that would become the possession of Abram's seed. But now God shows him not the land, but instead he showed him the stars of heaven. The uncountable stars, which represent in some way the number of children that would surely come forth from his own body. And here is one of the seminal acts attributed to Abram that places him on that list of heroes of the faith, the one that we find in Hebrews chapter 11. Because, even though it was physically and naturally impossible for him and Sarah to produce a child because of their age, he chose to believe God. But there's more. The account doesn't end there. Let's go on to the next couple of verses. We're looking at now verses 7 and 8. The scripture reads, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? <laughs> now, this passage seems to be completely contradictory to what we just read in verse 6. Why? Well, verse 6 says that Abraham believed God. But immediately thereafter, Abraham asked God for what? A sign. A sign that what God had just told him and what he purported to believe was really true. Excuse me. It seems like Abraham's talking out of both sides of his mouth. Uh, so what was Abram's problem? 
Abraham's problem was that he was human. It's what we do. It's what humans do. When I read this account, Abraham's response here really didn't surprise me. Uh, instead, it, it brought to my mind a man I remembered reading about in the New Testament. A man who expressed the very same dichotomy of thought. But he did it in a little more straightforward way. I think he was a little more open, a little more honest about it. And so for that, let's go to the New Testament and look at this man that we find in the book of Mark. And we're going to read Mark 9, 14 through 24, which tells this or gives this account. Beginning with verse 14, the scripture reads, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, this is Jesus now, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. So, let's kind of set the scene here. In Jesus' absence, his disciples had tried and failed to remove a demon from this child. And the scribes who were present and witnessed their failure seized the opportunity to defame both them and, by extension, their master, <clears throat> Jesus. And I'm certain they began to ride them with no small amount of glee. I, I can almost hear them. What's the matter? Can't you do this? I thought you were disciples of the great Jesus. Is this too difficult for you? But right in the middle of that, and before things could degenerate any further, Jesus shows up. And the scripture says that when they saw him, they were amazed. Question. The people had seen Jesus before. So why, at this particular time, did they react with amazement? Why? What was amazing? Well, do you remember from whence Jesus was coming? The Mount of Transfiguration. And what happened there? Well, among other things, we're told in Matthew 17, 12, that Jesus' face shone as the sun. It became brilliant. Another question. When Moses met with God, 
on Mount Sinai, and he returned to the people. What was different about his appearance? Yeah, in Exodus 34, 29, we're told that his face shone so much so that it made the people very uncomfortable. And he needed to cover it with a veil. And a number of Bible commentators believe that because Jesus had just returned from the Mount of Transfiguration, he must have had somewhat of what we would call an afterglow. Uh, not necessarily to the extent that was recorded of Moses, but enough to where his countenance was noticeably bright and fresh. There was something a little startling or a little amazing about his appearance. I think there's some good reason to give consideration to that commentary. It makes sense, and it would explain why the people were amazed when they saw him. Something was different. So, Jesus arrives, and he goes right to the scribes, and he asks them to tell him what they were questioning the disciples about. And what was their answer? Crickets. They had no answer. Their answer was silence. They made a quick decision to keep their powder dry, so to speak, until, until they saw what Jesus was going to do. In fact, it wasn't them, it was the father of the child, not the scribes, the father of the child who spoke up. So after he describes the state of the child, which we read, he says to Jesus, listen, if, if you can do anything, help us. And as Jesus often did, he replied to that question with another question. And he says to the Father, If, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. And the response of the Father is the reason why I came to this passage. He says, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. The father believed that Jesus had the power to heal his child. Because if he didn't, he wouldn't have brought his child to him. But he also was honest enough to admit that along with his faith, he also retained some level of doubt. He acknowledged his weakness. That man believed in Jesus, but he was asking Jesus to help him overcome those lingering doubts that wouldn't leave him. This is where we all live, you and me. We live there. We live in the land of lingering doubts. It's true. So that father had faith in Jesus, but what? It wasn't perfect faith. He was just like Abraham. And Abraham's just like we are. None of us, not a one of us, has perfect faith. Well, how do I know that? Well, let me ask you a question. It's a quick test. Can any of you out there, and I'll include myself, can say to a mountain, be thou removed, and it will be removed? I'm going to say no. If I had perfect faith, if you had perfect faith, it would be. So, Lord willing, next week, we're going to talk about perfect faith versus imperfect faith. So until then, please remember to pray for all of those on our prayer list. And until next time, Shalom.